Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all to this panel discussion, which is a part of the World Economic Forum's Jobs Reset uh, Summit. My name is Sally Bundock. I am the moderator for this discussion. I work for BBC News. Uh, depending on where you're watching us in the world will depend on when you can find me on BBC World News, but I am in Europe for European time. I am the morning anchor, the morning presenter of the news um, and my specialism is business and economics and finance and I'm a, a regular attendee at the World Economic Forum in Davos um, which I will miss uh, not being there this January I have to say. So that's who I am. I'll be moderating this discussion today which will look at the uh, the WEF Future of Jobs report in more detail, which was released yesterday, of course, and discuss the global skills outlook scenarios for learning a reset. So we have got a fantastic lineup of panelists for you today. And before I introduce them to you, we have a short video to put this discussion into context. COVID-19 is one of the biggest crises of our time. It has impacted every single one of us, shaken our social systems, and disrupted every sector of our economies. The automation of work combined with the global recession led workers to lose their jobs at an accelerated pace compared to previous years. And this trend is expected to continue. The ongoing shift in the division of labor between humans, machines, and algorithms might displace 85 million jobs worldwide in the next five years. While 97 million new roles, ones that are more adapted to this new task distribution, may emerge. By 2025, companies expect to displace roughly 6% of their total workforce. One in two workers will need reskilling and those remaining in their current roles will need to update 40% of their skill set to adapt to the changing labor market. There is a way to collectively benefit from these challenging times. Decades of research have shown that the most valuable asset of any economy or company is its human capital. Around the globe, companies are already experiencing a shortage in relevant skills for future roles and are investing in reskilling and upskilling their workforce. By 2025, organizations say they will train over 70% of their employees to ensure they can smoothly transition into the jobs of tomorrow. These include DevOps engineers, artificial intelligence specialists, digital marketing managers, talent acquisition specialists, and customer success specialists. It will take on average between two weeks and five months for workers to pick up new skills, allowing them to move into these new roles. But data shows they won't need to have the perfect skill set to start transitioning. While two thirds of employers expect to get a return on investment in employees reskilling programs within just one year, governments will also need to step in to update and fund education and training systems and to ensure displaced workers have adequate safety nets. With purposeful leadership and collaboration, we can turn this global crisis into a unique opportunity to transition into a future of jobs that is inclusive, fair, and sustainable. So let me introduce to you um, our panelists today who have got a broad range of expertise and experience to share with us all. Um, and so let's uh, get started. First up, we have got Sadia Zahidi, who's a uh, managing director of the World Economic Forum. It's great to have Sadia with us because she's co-author of the Future of Jobs report. She heads up the Forum Center for uh, the New Economy and Society and is a member of the managing board at WEF. Also, we have Jeff Maggion Calder, who is chief executive of Coursera, and uh, it's a company dedicated to transforming lives through learning and is a partner with WEF and has been involved in the compilation of this report as well. Jeff and his company, they're based in California, uh, and, but they work with people, millions of people from all over the world who want to learn and retrain. And they also work, of course, with employers as well, those who are looking for help in transforming their talent. We also have with us Syed Zulfiqar Abbas Bukhari, who's joining us from Pakistan, is Minister of State and Special Assistant to the Prime Minister for Overseas 
Pakistanis and the human resource development. Syed is also chairman of Pakistan's National Tourism Coordination Board. Also joining us from Paris, I assume, where the OECD is, we have Andreas Schleicher, who is Director of Education and Skills with the OECD. He's been with them uh, since 1994 and has had several key roles at the OECD. We have Majid Jafar as well, who is Chief Executive of Crescent Petroleum uh, in the UAE. It's the Middle East's oldest privately held oil and gas company. Majid, though, is also a supporter of many initiatives in the field of education and tackling youth unemployment and sits on various non-profit boards. And also we have joining us from Indonesia, we have Kang Poak, who's direct, uh, Deputy Secretary General ASEAN socio-cultural uh, community. His role includes supporting the Secretary General uh, and of ASEAN and oversees the implementation of projects under ASCC that focuses on forging a common identity and building a caring and sharing society. So a very warm welcome to all our panelists and thank you for being available today. And also for all of you watching us uh, right now who are watching us live as we stream this panel. We would like you to be very much involved as well. If you press the chat button, you'll see the chat conversation that's ongoing and you'll see the directions there from the forum where they're saying, please share your reflections, your comments, your questions for our panelists. And we'll have some time uh, within this discussion to put your questions to them. But also we'll have a poll in the middle of this discussion. So we'd love to get your votes and your opinions in the poll as well. So be as interactive as you possibly can and share on social media, hashtag uh, jobs reset is the uh, hashtag to use. So let's get started. Sadia, if you can uh, begin the proceedings, if we start with you, can you outline for us the skills outlook in the future of jobs report? Thank you, Sally. Uh, let me try to offer three facts that are starting to emerge from the report and then what the implications may be. The first is that regardless of whether uh, certain roles are growing or declining, if you take the average job in just the next five years alone, 40% of the core skills in that job will change. That roughly means that about half of what each of us is doing today will look very different in just five years time. This applies across the board as an average across all jobs. The second element is the types of skills that are going to be important again in the next five years. So analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning, active listening and learning strategies, um, technology use and monitoring, creativity, originality and initiative. These are the types of things that traditionally have not been emphasized by education systems um, and are things that people tend to pick up in the workplace. Now, these are going to be at a premium and rising. And then the third element is, um, do we have a case for a return on investment? And we find yes. Two out of three employers said that they will get a return on investment if they invest in people's skills. But in this current recession and with the economic pressures that they are facing, they're not necessarily taking a decision based on that clear dollar value return on investment and in fact are taking very short term decisions that lead to layoffs. So implications, workers will have to take much more ownership of their own reskilling and upskilling. Second implication, businesses will have to think differently about the math. They'll have to think differently about the long-term um, thinking here as opposed to the short-term quarterly thinking that they're currently doing when it comes to retaining workers and reskilling and upskilling them. And finally, governments. We find that right now, most businesses who are responding to us are saying they're only able to get public sector support for about 21% of them. Now that is too little, even at a time where governments are providing so much fiscal stimulus. So governments will have to think very differently about the type of funding that is allocated to retraining and reskilling workers so that they are actually ready for the jobs of tomorrow. Thanks, Sally, back over to you. Okay, thank you. Andreas, if I bring you in at this point, you know, from the perspective of the OECD and, and what it is finding in, in your area of specialism, in, in light of what Sadi has just said of what is ahead, What's the OECD's findings on this? Uh, 
Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think the biggest dilemma for education, at least at the foundations, is that the kind of things that are easiest to teach and maybe easiest to test have also become easiest to digitize, to automate. Now, the world simply no longer rewards people just for what they know. Google knows everything. Uh, it rewards people for what they can do with what they know. And, uh, state of the art knowledge, of course, is always going to remain somewhat important, but success in education is no longer just about reproducing knowledge. It's about extrapolating from, from what we know, applying our knowledge creatively in novel setting. In fact, I think the report from the WEF captures those things really, really well. It's about, you know, can you think like a scientist rather than, you know, do you know a specific formula and equation? The social and emotional skills are becoming so much more important. I mean, these are the ones that complement the artificial intelligence that we've created in our computers actually best and we're weakest in developing them. So education is no longer, should no longer be just about teaching people some things, but about providing them with a kind of reliable compass and the navigation tools to find their own way. Now you can no longer quit people once for their life, but you need to provide. And we don't have so much a supply problem. There's a lot of lifelong learning out there. It's a more of a demand problem, equipping people with the foundations, the learning strategies, the pandemic, has perfectly brought that out as well. And in fact, today we're publishing at the OECD our first assessment of <clears throat> global competency, where we look beyond, you know, reading, maths, and science. To what extent, you know, students are open to change. To what extent can they think imaginatively? Can they? To what extent can they work with people who are different from them? And you have a few countries, you know, like you know Singapore or Canada, doing great on this. But it also shows most of our education system have such a long way to go to get them. And this is just about the foundations. Syed, would you agree with that? I know that in Pakistan, that the government's worked very, very closely with the, the private sector, hasn't it, when it comes to education and what they're trying to achieve. Syed, are you able to hear us? Yeah, I just, yeah, I can hear you. I think, I think he's right, but I think what's uh, most important at the moment is that there's been a whole spin on things with COVID. Uh, you know, things become pear shaped from where you went. If our government was focused quite heavily. We had two, three programs, youth programs, which were is in particular in Pakistan, which is a 65% youth under the age of 35. So we've got this massive uh, youth bulge coming in. And um, so the prime minister had put in three different various uh, uh, programs in order to engage them. And then all of a sudden you get hit by COVID. So the first thing that you're looking at is livelihood uh, rather than reskilling and, and, and vocational training, technical training. Now what we are doing is that we're trying to spend, we're trying to bring in more accreditation and standardization into our, our skilling. It's something which is very important for a country like Pakistan where previously they didn't have any. We have certain technical vocational training and national training centers, but they weren't accredited anywhere. So that caused a big problem uh, for our youth, especially, or for, for our citizens, especially being employed nationally and internationally. So we've, we've put a program together where we're, where we're looking over around 10,000 centers across Pakistan to bring them to a certain standard. Um, when you talk of uh, human capital going abroad, uh, standardization plays a big role, um, like Philippines, uh, as my colleague has just mentioned, and, and Sri Lanka and other countries have done fairly better uh, than Pakistan. So we, we, the main thing that we are looking at is trying to bring standardization and, and accreditation into the country, along with bringing the private sector into this. A, a country like Pakistan can't in five years term set up enough centers or educational institutions. So what it can do is involve the private sector. When you're short in funding, when you've got other economic restraints, uh, it's very important to bring in the private sector with it. And that's, that's what we're trying to do now and look at the future, become more of a tech-based, uh, as Sadia mentioned, you know, in, the, in one of the five is, is technology and bring in the tech-based uh, because of the 65% youth there. Jeff, uh, this is completely what your business is doing, isn't it? Um, in, in a sense, not so much with those within education, but already in the workplace, is that correct? And, and if that is the case, 
in terms of the, the report coming coming out from WEF this week, what are your insights into what is needed going forward? Yeah, thanks, Sally. It is absolutely our business. Many people remember Coursera and others that launched at the same time, uh, edX and Udacity and others, um, for open courses that are, that are available directly to individuals. And, and that direct channel, I think, was important to galvanize access to high quality learning. But in the last five years, Coursera has also started offering courses from our university and industry partners through institutions. Six years ago, uh, we started working on and we launched about five years ago, Coursera for Business. We now have almost 3000 businesses using our partners courses on a platform, which is highly dynamic and accessible. It works on desktop as well as mobile. Um, they are using uh, our partners courses in order to upskill and reskill their employees. We have governments now, over 300 government agencies, um, including some of the participants here, uh, upskilling and reskilling their workforces, both with university courses as well as industry certifications. And then just a year ago in October, we launched Coursera for Campus. This allows other educational institutions to offer our partners online courses to their students. And this is what we're, where we've seen the biggest growth. We had 30 customers in February who were universities that has grown to 4,000 in the last seven months. So institutions are really coming to play in terms of providing these kinds of skilling platforms for individuals. And presumably the pandemic has really accelerated all of that. It must have done. It did. It started immediately with individuals. We saw six, 700% increases in the mid to late March uh, through, I'd say, June time period. That tapered off a little bit. Um, in the summer, although it's still higher than it was last year. Where we've seen really the sustained demand though, uh, and still increasing is with the institutional response, which has, which has grown from, um, I mean, it's, been, it's grown by probably 20, 30 times, the number of learners through institutions learning on Coursera. So yeah, really a, a very, very large demand directly from individuals as well as through institutions. Uh Deputy Secretary General Kong, if I could bring you in at this point, um, if you had an opportunity for a reset, which we may do now, what would you want our education and learning systems of the future to look like? Well, actually, you know, we start talking about, you know, the impact of uh, forced industrial revolution, automations, you know, all of this, you know, uh, disruptions, uh, even before the uh, pandemic, but then, you know, a uh, yeah, pandemic came. It adds on, you know, another challenges, you know, to how we are going to address all of these problems. Of course, you know, in addressing, you know, the skill problems in the region, I would like to also highlight, you know, uh, we are a bit unique in a sense that we are very diverse. You have countries that are, you know, at the lower end, and then you also have countries at the higher end. So you look at, you know, the uh, key strategies that we, we put in place that reflect, you know, such diversity. But of course, you know, uh, when we look at the uh, education systems in, in the region, you know, prior to the uh, pandemic and, and now, you know, with this uh, uh, severe crisis, uh, of course, you know, how we can prepare, you know, our region to be future ready, you know, uh, uh, especially our, our young, uh, young people in terms of what kind of skills they need, uh, the 21st century skills and so on. And another component that I would like to also highlight is, uh, what is different also this time is that we are trying to, you know, to strengthen the partnership between the education uh, institutions, the ministry that are responsible for, you know, providing the education and the private sector, uh, because this is also very important. You know, those are the people who are going to provide the job for the uh, students in the region. So such a partnership is also, you know, built through the institution that we established and also, you know, the, the key document that we, 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 we put out, of course, I think we have to also you know, acknowledge the fact that we have to, to also get the basic right, right? I mean, uh, lifelong learning, you know, early childhood education, and even the curricula, now we're also looking at it uh, again, how we can make it you know, more adaptive and, 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 and can tailor you know, to specific need of students and so on. So all of this, you know, uh, combinations of how we are going to you know, see ourselves uh, in the uh, next five or 10 years in terms of the skill prospects, but also how we can, you know, continue to, to strengthen, you know, our foundations in terms of, you know, 
uh, the kind of education that we we are going to provide to our people. You know, of course, we 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 want to make sure that they have all of this uh, new skills and so on, so that they can you know adapt to the kind of you know uh, uh, works in the future. But at the same time, we have to ensure that they have the literacy skills, they have the you know numeracy skills. So these are you know some of the basic skills that 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 we want to make sure that they have it before we, you know, kind of, you know, imagine further to, you know, other sets of skill. But of course, you know, we are doing all of this uh, at the same time. And, you know, the strategies are also, you know, kind of tailor uh, depending on the situation of the uh, member states as well. As I mentioned, you know, they, they have different level of development. You have Singapore, but you also have Laos, uh, Myanmar, and, you know, so we have to uh, be practical uh, uh, when it comes to, you know, what kind of policy we advise our member state yeah, I must admit, you're, you're absolutely right. You probably have got one of the most diverse regions in terms of, you know, uh, the economic challenges and all the other challenges as well and, and the changes that is going on. Majid Jafar, from your perspective, uh, with the COVID pandemic, one of the outcomes has been, of course, one of the terrible consequences has been millions of people are now finding themselves out of work and quite a large proportion of those are young people. Now you you do a lot of work when it comes to youth unemployment. In terms of this report that's come out, in terms of uh, a reset, what can we um, put in practice for the young, those who are out of work? And in some countries, youth unemployment is extremely high. So in our region, in the Middle East, it is the highest in the world, unfortunately, 30% uh, according to the World Bank and climbing. And it's even worse, in, uh, female youth unemployment is 40%. So it's been a chronic problem and now it's become even more of an acute crisis uh, where on top of all the conflicts, refugees, displaced people we have in our region, we now also have the COVID crisis. And it's hitting young people harder and it's hitting developing countries harder around the world. So we've uh, found that through looking at all the research, three key areas of skills which are lacking uh, and in the public education system that we have in the region here and in many developing countries is English language skills, basic IT skills and soft skills. And we have the strange situation here in the Middle East where for many years now, employers, are companies are trying to recruit and complaining they can't find uh, the right uh, skilled uh, labor and yet the, there's high youth unemployment. So there's a mismatch clearly between what, what the modern job market requires and what uh, the public education systems are providing for the graduates. So reform of education systems is absolutely important. I totally agree, but that's a generational challenge and it's not easy in many of these countries. So we tried to think, what can we do now, you know, using the online, using the fourth industrial revolution tools? And so we partnered with IDRAC, which is the massive online open course platform of the Queen Rania Foundation and the British Council to create a, a bespoke course that we call the career readiness track uh, in these three key areas, English language, basic IT skills and soft skills. We launched it earlier this year. It was building on an excellent initiative we did in partnership with the World Economic Forum with Saadia actually a few years ago, but we thought we'd scale it up. Uh, and we launched it earlier this year. We targeted half a million young people across the Middle East and North Africa. And we're very pleased to see that already as of now, we've had two, over 240,000 uh, registrants. So the appeal has been high. And this is you know, one example of ways we can help young people who are trying to get onto the career ladder. Uh, and it's that first job that's always the hardest uh, to bridge the gap uh, in skills uh, for the modern workplace. And in terms of government involvement, um you know, getting the attention of government, because this is a tricky thing right now with COVID happening, with many economies in recession, there is so much pressure on, on government, especially the money is just pouring out of its coffers as well. So what are you finding in terms of support and a listening ear in government in terms of what they need to do? 
So for our particular initiative, we, we didn't ask for any government support. It's totally private sector and, and these nonprofit organizations with whom we're involved. Uh, and it direct, and this is the, the, the beauty of an online uh, open course platform. You go direct to the users. You don't need to rely on schools and universities. And actually, we're targeting those of university age and post-university age who are already, uh, you know, uh, in, who, who are really the key segment uh, when it comes to youth unemployment. Definitely government's role and tackling the reforms in the education systems, as we heard from uh, you know, my other co-panelists, is very important. But that's further upstream. That's for the, the children of today to be better prepared for the jobs of the future. And that absolutely has to happen hand in hand. But we cannot allow ourselves to neglect the current generation. Uh, we don't want a lost generation. And it was already very much a risk in our region and many other regions in the world, particularly as we only had the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Uh, but then on top of that, now we have COVID. So we really need to act now to try and help those currently seeking a job who are already out of education. Yeah, okay. I'm just uh, looking at some questions we're receiving now from um, various people who are watching us. And it's great to get all your questions in. Um, there is a question here about the global education system and how uh, governments in the developing world can help improve early childhood education to help shape the future of society. Private sector in every country is working hard on this while governments are staying behind. That is Mohammed Taher who's put this to all the panelists. Sadia, what, what would you say in response to that question? I think um, uh, the, 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 the framing there is correct in the sense that there has been some focus on trying to reform um, education systems, but as, as I'm sure Andreas and many others would agree, much more needs to be done um, to, to upgrade those systems. However, when it comes to lifelong learning and adult retraining and reskilling in particular, that's where there really is a vacuum. There are 3 billion people in the world's workforce who will not go back to basic education systems. And as we just heard from Majid, that is where a lot of the focus needs to be if we want to ensure that as a revival comes back into the economy, as the jobs market gets more dynamic again, um, we use this current window of opportunity to actually give people the right kinds of skills. Now at the World Economic Forum, we are aiming to work with multiple governments to actually set up the kinds of public private collaboration systems that allow for this to happen. It won't be from government alone, it won't be from business alone, but if we bring those two sectors together and provide a lot more online learning and training, this can work. Um, and we have 10 countries at the moment that are doing such experiments. We'll announce a bit more of that later on today, but it's become very clear that you need a model like that to be able to accelerate that kind of adult reskilling. Okay, I'm conscious of time. So I want to introduce the poll now because we have talked quite a bit about what the obstacles could be to, uh, you know, equipping students and workers with the skills of the future. So we'd like to ask all of you watching us right now to give us your response to this and we will look at the results shortly and we'll discuss the results. So what is the biggest obstacle? Is it inability to accurately identify the skills of the future, inefficient government planning and action, lackluster private sector involvement in skilling, inefficient, uh, insufficient skills delivery mechanisms low motivation investment of individuals in lifelong learning or maybe something else. And you can use the Zoom chat um, function to give us your response to that. So do uh, give us your reply to that poll and we shall discuss that in more detail in a moment. But here's more questions from those watching us uh, at the moment. We've got Ms. Uh, Miroslav Dragunov, uh, who is um, in touch and says, do you consider as the most necessary to upskill all tech workers now and in the next five years with people's, people's and soft skills? And what is the best way to do so according to you? So if I can put that to you initially, Jeff, um, what do you consider as, is it necessary to upskill everyone, you know, all tech workers, should they be upskilled? Should they be retrained in areas such as soft skills? 
I think every uh, worker does need new skills. The world's just changing so quickly. The tools that we use to work together, the ways that we work together uh, collaboratively in, in, in online workspaces, there's a lot more around design thinking. There's a lot more around agile pro product development. There's a whole new world of creativity with respect to creating digital experiences for customers. So I think everybody does need new skills. When we look at institutions and we advise them on how do you go about this, it's a massive problem. I think it's much more difficult, by the way, for, for the K through 12 than the uh, adult learning. Adult learning, at least there is a more immediate and measurable economic payback. Usually the, the buyer is the person who's gonna enjoy the benefit. And uh, of, of course, adults have a motivation in looking for jobs. And so I, I do think that the adult piece of this, uh, to Sadia's point, is a bit easier to do. But what we have seen companies do initially, I'd say five years ago, a lot of it was we need to reskill people. And then they would announce, uh, and it's better than doing nothing, but it was sort of, hey, everybody, you need to start learning. Here's a huge cornucopia of learning resources, like go figure it out. And most individuals are busy. Many don't really have so much motivation unless they're given a little bit more uh, incentive and, and structuring guidance. And the companies that seem to be for us as we watch the skills development, uh, the engagement and the completion rates, it's the companies that really pick which jobs first are the ones that are going to need which skills first for my business to perform well against competition. So really looking at the job role and looking at the particular skills and often looking at the precise tools that the people need to use so that you can apply the skill, the, the knowledge that you're learning, um, as Andreas said, I think is, is spot on. And so if you look at the, at, the, at the report that the World Economic Forum put out, it's just spot on. If you look at the increasing demand, start with the jobs, data analysts and scientists, AI and machine learning, big data specialists, digital marketing and strategy specialists, process automation, those are the jobs that are in high demand and the skills to do those jobs are the first skills to learn in the long term creativity persuasion self management all the soft skills are also going to be important but the economic payoff to those hardcore skills in order to do those emerging jobs seems to be where companies are getting the earliest traction andreas do you want to uh, give us your take on that as well yeah you know i think also i want to sorry uh, I, I, we sorry. can hear you don't worry good <laughs> No, I, I want to also introduce another dimension. I think what we can see clearly in the COVID pandemic is that, as Sadia also said, those countries that have been able to integrate the private and public sectors and actually quickly draw on new technologies and new providers, they have been extremely successful. And as Jeff explained, there's a lot of opportunity for people to learn from. But the one area where I think governments have a key role to play is to create a currency to recognize that learning. The big issue that we have today is why is it it's so hard to move someone from you know who's got unemployed in the airline industries to become you know a medical kind of worker or to move someone who's in the hospitality industry to become uh, people to care for the elderly because they're not very good in recognizing the skills i'm a great fan of coursera you know you can learn a lot of things but you actually don't get credited for that and employers have a still a hard time to recognize the skills and i do think the quick the quick answer that governments can do is to create a currency that actually allows people to you know, market the kind of things that they learn. Because at the moment, we have lots of people who, do not, who are not motivated and incentivized to keep on learning throughout their lives simply because it doesn't translate into better jobs and better lives, at least not in the immediate future. So I think that's an area where I think we should not lose attention, creating good you know, qualification frameworks, creating good standards, and ones that are open to not just to the big monopolies like universities, but that are open to any provider. Um, Syed, if I could bring you in at this point, because there's an interesting question from uh, someone watching us, Karen Mangia. Hello to you, Karen. She raises the issue of, of access. Just a very basic point. Worldwide, she says 346 million youth are not connected to the internet. Three out of five young people in Africa are offline compared to one in 25 in Europe. So how are we going to re retrain when basic access is lacking. I mean, that's a very good point, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Especially for uh, countries with, with aged populations and with countries like uh, Africa that she was mentioning that in, in Africa, they don't have the access. 
and it's very difficult for them to pick it up at this stage, even when they do get uh, involved. But I think what two things I just saw that two of the colleagues um, uh, mentioned, especially David's point about currency and about payback. Um, I think those two are extremely vital. Reason being is that governments or the private sector only get involved or only try to do things based on their payback. If you look maybe 20 years ago, you wouldn't see someone with an environmental degree going into banking. But as time progressed, you see people coming into the banking sector and others that are from boss, uh, from different, they have different degrees and, and, and bachelors. That's because the whole, there's been a paramount shift towards doing that. And they look at how well you've done in your region. I think if we can bring that in, that sort of mindset into uh, employment, general formal and informal employment, Pakistan's, you know, it's about 76 million uh, labor force out of which give and take is about 72 million is informal. So it's even more difficult for us. You only have about a, a 4 million uh, formal employment uh, over here. So, and, and then you've got this bulge of two and a half million people coming in every year that are in the employment state. Uh, age rather. Bring, coming back to your question about how do we bring them in, the people that don't have the access, let's say you use the example of the internet. I think that's where, again, as Saadi had mentioned and I had mentioned earlier, is the partnership between the private and the government. The government has to set the policy, has to give the governance of where it wants to go, has to give the vision, the mindset, and that, and the private sector has to then fund that, bring that in and bring it in and execute it. Um, in, in, for example, in Pakistan, like I said, especially with, with COVID, we became, or even prior to COVID, we were very supply driven. We just decided that these are our two, three sectors and we ended up just skilling people and making sure that they went into these certain sectors. Eventually, over a decade later, we realized we had an oversupply and less demand because uh, we were never following what was being demanded of us. I think when countries follow the demand shift, you'll find it becoming far more successful because again, you have a payback for it. And that's very important. Let it be private, let it be public. Um, right. Naturally, COVID, like I said, turned it on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Put a spanner in the works in many, in many senses. Let's have a look at the poll results then and see what uh, people feel the obstacles are. So we asked what, what is, when the key obstacles in terms of equipping students and giving them the skills. It looks like most believe, more than 30%, inefficient government planning and action. Uh, we've got behind that inability to accurately identify the skills of the future. You can understand why that would seem to be uh, an issue. Let's now bring in uh, Deputy Secretary General uh, Kong. Uh, what, what would you say in response to those to the poll that we've just had where government is seen as one of the biggest obstacles in terms of a skills reset? Well, uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, uh, of course, when there's there's a problem, we, we often relate it to the uh, failures of the government, you know, in terms of doing some things and so on. Uh, but I would like, you know, to also put this in a broader context as well. Of course, you know, all colleague, you know, all, all, all the identifies, you know, the, the need, you know, for the government to, to, to invest in uh, providing uh, high quality education and the right skill for uh, the people because there's also a high economic return to that. So of course the government understand, you know, this basic fact, you know, it is some things that they need to, you know, uh, do more and, and in, invest. So for us, you know, at least, you know, as a regional body, we are trying to, you know, support the government as much as possible in terms of uh, identifying the areas that they, they, they can look at, you know, uh, again, you know, we have different, level of development so there are different skills uh, set that each country may need in terms of you know putting the, the money to to further develop uh, those skills uh, it's 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 a job in progress i have to say now you know what we are uh, uh, trying to do is to improve the government capability and capacity you know to better plan for that 
uh, again, uh, if we are talking about the commitment of the, the government, it is something they are trying to do. But at the same time, you know, we, we need to also support them in terms of identify what are, what, what are the, the, the skill sets, you know, that each country uh, need to focus more on how they are going to, you know, spend the money in uh, improve, you know, those, those areas. Um, it's still a challenge, I have to say, you know, we have a lot of, you know, regional priorities and commitment, and we are still working very hard, you know, to translate all of those regional commitments and priority uh, into national policies. And that's only the first step, because we also need to make sure that we have enough resources to implement all of, all of those. So I, I think that's that's one of the, 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 the problems. And uh, of course, there are you know, other issues of, you know, governance and so on. But I think the, the main the main issues is how we are going to support the governments in terms of identifying the priority area that they can, you know, continue to to invest on. Because I, I think, you know, from what we have been we've been doing with the member state, we, we know clearly that this is something that they really want to know. But then, you know, there's always uh, the problems of, you know, the lack of capacity and capability when it comes, you know, to uh, do the planning and, and, and putting yeah. in place, you know, a, a, a concrete and, and uh, sound, you know, strategies. All right. We've got five minutes to go. So we want to try and get as many uh, questions to you as we can. Um, Majid, if I just put this question to you, and also would like to get your response to the poll as well, the second element, which is it's quite hard to identify uh, what skills are required going forward. And that's part of an obstacle, people's lack of understanding. But we've got Leila Toplik who says, uh, what role do you envision for teachers and other facilitators of learning in the future? How do we make sure that they too can become lifelong learners? and have the support that they need to create meaningful learning experiences for their students. A very good point there. I think that's an excellent point. And in too many countries, uh, in, in our part of the world here, but across the world, uh, teacher training and uh, teacher salaries in the public health, the public education system isn't where it needs to be. Teaching is almost uh, seen as a kind of backup uh, option as opposed to a proper career lifelong dedication which of course it is so there needs to be much more in investment there and then another thing from in, in our part of the world and i think it applies to other developing countries there's an over reliance on public sector uh, employment uh, and yet the, and that the governments are complaining that, that you know, the private sector isn't recruiting enough a big part of that of course is job security public sector jobs are seen as uh, lifelong jobs uh, even if they pay less, and in some countries in our region, they actually pay more, uh, they're preferred. So I think if you have a social safety net that at least has basic unemployment benefit and health and education, then the uh, over-reliance on the public sector for employment isn't there. And the last point is on expectations. A lot of young people today, and I think it's in our part of the world, the Middle East, North Africa, but you also see it in, in, in Europe and elsewhere, that uh, there's a university degree is where everybody heads to. And then based on that graduation from the university program, there's an expectation of an office job or a management position, uh, rather than investing in the necessary technical skills. Now, some countries do it better than others, Germany, Switzerland, where there are uh, technical colleges and also apprenticeship programs and a much closer linkages between the education sector and the private sector. And that really helps people get onto the career ladder. Unfortunately, in many other parts of the world, particularly the developing world, those linkages are not there and they really need to be built. We're almost out of time, Jeff. I know you wanted to add some points there. And also if you can identify what you think are the top priorities now. So I was one of the 13%, I guess, uh, who said that learning motivation and ability of individuals is one of the limiting factors I feel at what, what we're seeing at Coursera is the fastest and, mo and the most highly leveraged way to get access to, to, to create impact is, is for governments mostly to create a coordinating mechanism. The marginal cost of delivering online learning, this is both knowledge in terms of the theory and concepts that are taught by universities and industry, as well as hands-on learning. We have Coursera Labs. It'll teach you how to use any software in the world, any desktop software, any, uh, any cloud-based software. I mean, the ability to learn, even on mobile phones, even offline, even with limited data plans, the ability to learn is, is very high and it's, it's growing even higher. Knowing what to learn and having the discipline to learn and having the incentive to learn, I think is a big part of this. I will say that uh, I sort of 
we call them learning credentials. Uh, as, as Syed mentioned, I think that it's important for individuals to believe that if they invest the time to learn something, they're gonna get rewarded with some economic benefit. The credential from some institution that says this person knows this thing is important. The one thing I'll throw out there uh, to, to Andreas's point, there are existing credentials like university degrees that are completely being reinvented from the inside out. Universities, thousands of universities are now offering, we've had 20 million course enrollments in seven months among students in universities using courses on Coursera online to earn their college degree. So we don't necessarily need to bring in all new credentials. We can bring in new content. And if the, if the regulators allow that content to, act, to count towards an existing credential, that could be a speedy way to reform and upgrade the skills being learned with existing credentials like college degrees. All right. And we're going to have to end it here, I'm afraid, because we are now out of time. So I would just like to say thank you so much to all our panelists for sharing your thoughts, your expertise, your experience with us this afternoon. And thank you also to all of you who've been so active in the chat room and uh, sharing your thoughts and your questions. Do keep it going. Keep this conversation going uh, as the day continues. But now I'm going to uh, say goodbye from us all. And, and again, thank you for your attention. And, and let's continue this very, very important conversation. And let's hope that the increase in understanding and the identification of priorities will help us all upskill in the future. Thank you all so much. <laughs>